Good night on Animal House Radio. Join us as we welcome back the very lovely and very talented Patricia Heaton. Listen in as she talks about her fantastic new book, Your Second Act, available on Amazon.com, and it's definitely a must-read. You'll also hear her tell you how she compiled all these inspirational stories, how she's handling COVID-19 and what she's doing to cope, and so much more. And it all happens right here, right now on Animal House Radio. Stations are tuned in to 5, 5, 4, 4, 3, 3, 2, 1, 1, 1, 1. We have ignition. Strap in. You're about to listen to the Animal House. You're nothing but an animal. Your mother's an animal. Show your food, you're an animal. Keep the change, you filthy animal. They're animals anyway, so let them lose their souls. I am not an animal. You are an animal. We are all animals. Animals, my lady. I'm not an animal! What do you care? You're an animal. You're an animal. Yeah. yeah. I'm an animal! Yeah. <laughs> Atomic batteries to power. Turbines to speed. I feel the need. The need for speed. Ramming speed! The opinions expressed by the hosts, callers, and guests are not those of Animal House Radio. Some of the material broadcast on Animal House Radio may not be suitable for listeners under the age of 18. Listener discretion is advised. Hello, this is Kelsey Grammer. Hi, this is Katie Segal. Hi, this is Joe Elliott. Hey, it's Rick Springfield. Hey, this is Tommy Chung. Hi, this is Carol Burdett. All right, everybody, listen up. This is Dee Snyder from Twisted Sisters, Frainsland, Celebrity Apprentice. Yeah, you know me. And you're listening to Animal House Radio. Hey, this is Larry the Cable Guy, and you're listening to the Animal House Radio Show. And if you're not listening to it, then leave the country. You're a communist. This is a good show right here. Get it up. Hello, Patricia. Hi, can you hear uh, me? I can hear you just fine. Oh, we're wearing hats. Wow, how cool is that? Yes. That's what you did when... <laughs> <laughs> uh, You know what? I want to thank you so much for coming back on with us. The last yeah. time we caught up with you, you were doing your cookbook. Right. And I was so excited to hear that you had another book out, but I was relieved it wasn't a cookbook and I, because I haven't lost the 20 pounds that I gained from the last book. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> looks good on you. No, but, uh, you know, um, this book, Your Second Act, it's been getting such a great response, and, and rightly so. Well, thanks. I'm, I'm really happy that in this difficult time, it might be giving some people inspiration. Uh, it's probably perfect timing if you think about it. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, it was supposed to come out this past May, and it was, you know, postponed because of the pandemic. So, but I actually think it was a good thing because People need to hear that you can get through tough times and you can change your life and you can go in a new direction and, and be successful at it. This pandemic has got everybody so crazy. And I got to tell you, Patricia, I, I want to thank you because uh, because of you and other actors and actresses, you're helping me get through. It. And what I mean by that is that I'm, I, I just refuse to watch the news. It'll it'll you'll you'll get crippled emotionally watching the news and I won't do it. I'm watching Everybody Loves Raymond. I'm watching The Middle. I'm watching Gilligan's Island, uh, you know. Um, yeah, just for example, the other day I was watching the middle and it was the episode where you're trying to get brick to stop saying whoop. And, <laughs> and you go, I did what any other mother would do in the next scene. You're spraying them with a spray bottle. Going, stop it. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> right. That's the kind of stuff that's getting me through this. And I know I could speak for a lot of other people to say that, you know. Right. I mean, I'm glad that, um, you know, that it's helping people. I agree. I mean, uh, HGTV is sort of my go to, you know, happy place watching people, <laughs> <laughs> watching people flip homes um, and decorate, you know, but I think it's, you know, I agree with you. And, you know, sometimes as a mainly comedy actor, you kind of think, well, you know, it's not brain surgery and it's kind of a silly job and um, people are out there saving lives. And here we are just sort of in the studio laughing our heads off and, goofing around, you know, but I do get that a lot from people um, since Raymond, where people would write or come up to me and say, you know, my dad was struggling with cancer and the only bright spot in the week where we saw him laugh is when you were on Everybody Loves Raymond and it really helped our family. So, you know, and it's good to hear from you too that, you know, it's, it's, it's helping to sort of lift you up a little bit. And I totally agree. I stay away from the news. Because when I just look at our everyday life here, 
uh, in California, you know, we're, we're very blessed to have a lot of sunshine and good weather and, and places to go for walks. So it, it's actually rather pleasant, you know, and I don't really know anybody who's contracted the virus in any serious way. I think there's been a few friends who have had it, but it maybe lasted five days and was rather mild. So that's been fortunate. Oh, um, yeah. So, but I, I think it's easy to go down a dark rabbit hole and I, you're right to avoid that. Yeah. You know, and I like, you know, I saw in a previous interview that you did that, you know, you're, I think you're handling it the, the best way possible. You're swimming, you're doing piano, you're going down to skid row. I mean, uh, that's, that's risky, but. <laughs> <laughs> I know, you know, I thought about it later because I'm planning on doing some more, you know, work and. Um, I was, I've actually been surprised that I haven't caught it because of where I've been going, you know, but uh, maybe God's just protecting me. But, you know, I, I think we all feel a little bit helpless. And I have a lot of friends who work in philanthropy, and it's been great to be able to join them yeah. um, because we all feel so helpless. And I think when you get out there and you're able to do something for somebody, you know, uh, um, that it, it makes you feel good. And I, I know there's a lot of people that are doing things like making masks and donating to food banks and things like that. So all those things help us all, I think. You know, so speaking of the food banks, I love the work you're doing with World Vision USA. Yes. Um, well, it's, it's great to do it all, all year round, but right now, you know, we need to do, help people out with that. Um, as you know, the show is on American Forces Network. So, you I mean, the last interview we did with you, we got like over 30,000 emails. I, they almost shut down the server, how much they love and love your work and everything. And, you know, I get a, I got a disturbing uh, email about how there's a, more now than ever homeless veterans. Yes. You know, and you see that on the street a lot, too. Um, there's great people here in Los Angeles who are helping out Claris Health, which is a, a pregnancy and family clinic that I'm on the board of. They're out in the streets making sure families have what they need. There's a wonderful church here called the Dream Center run by pastors Matthew and Caroline Barnett. And they, for 95 days, they did 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. drive through food bank, serving something like 25,000 people a day. And then they were starting it up again because Los Angeles shut down. So, you know, there's people that are doing really good work. Um, and then it's good to know that World Vision is all over the world helping people. I was just talking this morning with um, Catherine Compton, who's my liaison, about how, it, how it's going in Africa with uh, COVID. And it's not quite as intense, but they don't have any resources there. So people struggle for clean water, for electricity. Uh, medical care can often be very far away and people don't have transportation. So it, it hits harder in a different way. It also increases domestic violence and child abuse and things mm -hmm. like that. So, you know, it's good to know that they're on the ground and they have programs in place both around the world, but also in the U.S. They've been coordinating with a lot of people to get supplies to families. So there's a lot we all can do, I think. And, um, yeah. you know, that's what's great about this country is everybody really pitches in when things get rough. Well, no, you know what? That's one of the things. It's funny you said about, you know, in, in Africa, you know, I, as a comedian, you know, I always think about what Sam Kennison said. He goes, if... If, uh, you know, he talked about world hunger, he made a joke at him. He goes, he goes, why don't they just move to where the food is? You know, it was so it was like a whole big thing. But, you know, uh, Patricia, I hear a lot of conflicting things. You know, they say it's not that bad in L.A. Now I heard everything's going to be pushed back to September. That's what I'm saying. You don't know what to believe. Yeah, it's a little bit difficult because I think all the way along, there's been conflicting information coming from very different sources. And I think it's because it's so brand new. We're all figuring this out as we go along. And so what happens is, you know, the government thinks they have the correct information at the start and then it evolves and now it's changed. And it was like, no, you don't have to bother to wear a mask. Now it's everybody needs to wear a mask, which understandingly has caused people to distrust. Um, but I think we're all trying to figure it out. I don't have a problem with wearing a mask. Uh, you know, I, I'm not a nervous or a worrying type person. So I, I'm, I'm not fearful if somebody else is not wearing a mask, but I, you know, it's like, it, it, it's the, you know, if you go into a store, you, you wear a mask. I mean, it's, to me, it's not sort of infringing on my liberty. It's hard for me to wear them for very long because I get headaches pretty quickly 
when I'm wearing a mask. So I, I try to avoid being in situations where I need one. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I just think I hope that people can sort of calm down on all on all sides of this stuff. Yeah. And just yeah. find those places where we all agree and we can come together and not be so charged with emotion uh, on either end and just you know, we need to work together to get through this. We need to get the economy going again. There's so many people that are struggling. They don't have money to pay their rent. Parents are trying to get back to work and their kids aren't going to be able to go to school. And, you know, they're, they're, what are they going to do? You know, so the sooner we can all get through this together, the better. Yeah. You know what? It's funny because um, a lot of people don't want to go back to work because they're making more money staying home, which is going to, I see, a, a, you know, it's going to present a problem uh, down the road, but uh you know, your book, your second act. And I just want to see, you know, I know being in show business, you've got to be prepared for uh, success and setbacks. And I was very bummed out, you know, about they canceled Carol's second act because I loved it. I mean, I love everything you do. I thought you were you were a ball of fire on that show. It was hysterical. Yeah. You know, I don't understand how, how executive thinks. And, you know, I know it's hard to pinpoint what people are going to like and what they're not yeah. going to like. But, you know. What's what's good about it is, and I wanted to ask you, I love the fact that you you presented yourself in a very strong and positive way. You made a change in, in like in mid course, you know, mm -hmm. um, so what attracted you initially to that script, though, that made you say, I'd like this. I think the idea, you know, I, of, of a woman uh, um, after raising her children and going through divorce finds a really positive thing to do to, to, to fulfill her dream of becoming a doctor. And I thought that I hadn't done that before. It kind of matches my life now as an empty nester uh, up until the pandemic. And then I had three boys <laughs> in my house. Uh, so, <laughs> but at that time, I was an empty nester and, you know, uh, moving into producing feature films. So I was uh, uh, embarking on new things. And, and, and so I, I thought that's a nice thing to explore of uh, people my age. I'm 62. Um, you have, you know, God willing, maybe 30 good years left in your life. And that's a long time and you can do a lot in 30 years. So what are we doing with it? Mm -hmm. And so I thought that was nice to explore on the show. And then it made me think about um, talking to people who had done this in their lives and finding out how they did it and what were the pitfalls and how could they advise other people. And that's kind of what the book came out of. I think it's ironic that the show about second acts was then canceled. Right. Um, but that's par for the course in our industry. And um, I think, you know, maybe we didn't quite hit the mark. And part of having failures, and I talk about this in the book, you have to make failure your friend. You have to learn from it. If you learn from it, then it's not a failure. It's a lesson. Right, so you right. have to make your failures lessons. And then what did I contribute that, to this failure? Um, and what can I learn from that? And uh you know, hopefully you take something from it. And, and, and I think people in the entertainment industry are particularly well suited to um, this kind of thing and to trying new things because we, we do it all the time. Even yeah. if you're on a successful show, at some point it's going to end. So you always have to be prepared and be readying yourself for the next thing. Um, and I think we're just used to the ups and downs of our industry. And it, it really prepares us for things like a pandemic and for shows failing and for things not moving forward. You know, this is, it takes a lot to get a show on the air and moving and keeping it on there. It's, it's a really, really tough business. So the people who are in it are, are used to working hard and then failing, you know? And so right, right. in some ways that makes your life easier in a way because you're kind of prepared for when things go wrong. You know, you ever, you know, I, I can understand that. And especially in, in, in show business, it's, you know, there's ups and downs. Um, but I like one of the quotes from the book where you said, um, you just have to get out there and embrace your life. Um, yes. Yes. The, I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm sort of an adventurous person. And I think anybody who tries to pursue a career in the entertainment industry is a risk taker. It's not comfortable for everybody to do that, but, right. but you don't have to, you know, leave your, your home or um, make huge changes, you know, maybe it's just something within your community that you start doing. I talk about in the book, you know, ways to find a path if you're not quite sure, you know, you want to change and you're not quite sure what that would look like. There's a number of things you can do 
um, that are minimally risky. One thing is volunteering, uh, volunteering in the area of interest that you have. Right. And every community can use volunteers. There's always somebody that needs a helping hand. Another way is to take classes online. Now that we've had the pandemic, you're doing everything online. And there's a lot of very affordable classes you can take even through universities. Um, I talk about in the book, I took an online screenwriting course after oh, wow. the middle finished. And uh, I wasn't very good at it, <laughs> um, I, only because I had a hard time getting started because I was afraid I was, I was not going to be good when I wrote it. And it's sort of this problem of perfectionism, which I have to get over, right? And I talked to a lot of writers who said, you've just got to start putting it down on the paper and, and it's going to be bad and you're going to have to rewrite it, but you have to just start putting it down on the paper. But yeah. what I really took that class for was to become a better producer. I wanted to really learn from the inside what a writer's process is so that mm -hmm. when I was giving notes on a script, I could speak to them in their language and understand their process. Uh, so, you know, I... I think that you can take a lot of classes of anything you're interested in, whether it's a business class or an artistic endeavor. Uh, there's lots you can do there. And then, you know, we've had a lot of time on our hands since we've been locked down. In fact, I've, you, you've interrupted my cleaning out the garage. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm in a doghouse now. <laughs> I apologize for my appearance, but, but I'm like kind no. of a little filthy from being in the garage, you know, going through all these old boxes of things. Um, but what I do while I'm cleaning out cabinets and pantries and garages is I put podcasts on of things that I'm interested in. And I think okay. that's also a great way to explore areas that you, you might, you know, try dipping your toe into. So well, there's things that you can do. So you don't have to move to LA or to New York or, or make a huge change like that. You can do stuff and start to think about it right from where you are. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I know it's not a, a like a, a big thing, but I, I'm I'm a perfect example of that. You know, during this lockdown, I uh, I I want I always wanted to learn how to edit video and do stuff like that, and um, that's interesting about the screenwriting class. But it surprises me that you said you didn't do well. You have two successful books. How do you? I mean, I know they're they're sort of different, but how do you? I mean, I, you would think you would have that mastered already. The no, writing. it's a very it's a very different animal. Um, and outlining is the start, which I can do. It's funny, like, what's the first line of the script? Right. Like, what's the first piece of dialogue? And there's a million ways you can start a story. So how do you pick that one thing? And um, I have to say, it's, it's hard. And I have, I've always had a great deal of respect and admiration for writers because I've worked with some of the best in the in television uh, with Phil Rosenthal and the writing staff of Everybody Loves Raymond including right. Ray and then Eileen Heisler and Deanne Helene and the whole writing staff of The Middle and you, you know I've always known they were wonderful writers and to really sort of explore the process gives me even more admiration in the chat room one of our uh, servicemen overseas he says that you know don't worry about wearing a hat and that the fact that you were clean at the garage because he says from the looks of you you definitely stole the fountain of youth <laughs> well we have our ways in los angeles of looking young you know i have a, I have a bunch of doctors on speed dial <laughs> <laughs> you know um the fact that you always portrayed a strong woman was great. And I, you know, one thing I think you said in a previous interview, you said that we need them now more than ever. But if you look back historically, I know there wasn't that many, but I go back to like Knott's Landing where you had three strong female leads. Cause we just, we just interviewed Donna uh, Mills and she was great, but um, I liken you to them because you're, you are, you're setting the tone for a lot of people, a lot of women and, and, and all actors, male or female, yeah. but you're such a role model at this point in time. Well, I think television has always been a wonderful place for women. Women have been given so many opportunities early on. When you look at, um, remember the show, Julia. <clears throat> oh yeah. Yeah. First African-American woman to be a lead in a sitcom. And this is, what are we talking? The sixties, I think. Right. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> that's amazing. And you had even when you have it in the form of something like Charlie's Angels, um, it's still women leading, you know, sort of a, a, a procedural show. And um, there's been so many women. You look at Lucille Ball, you look at Mary Tyler Moore, um, Laverne and Shirley, yeah. uh, Maude, 
uh, you know, there's just so many designing women. Linda Bloodworth always wrote wonderful things. And I got to work with her on a very, another short lived a sitcom called Women of the House with Delta Burke and Terry Garr. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so, you know, the television has always been a wonderful place for women. And because the industry is evolving, you now have a lot of movie stars who are doing television. And that would be unheard of 10, even five years ago. Right. And, right. and now it's the place to be. So we are in an incredible golden age of television. Yeah, and you know I'm so I, I, happy to be here with that. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I found out, and you know, I didn't know this, I was a big Lucille Ball fan. She was the first female studio executive. Yes, she was really. And a Carol Burnett. Oh, I mean, yeah. Carol, what Carol Burnett did every week was just miraculous. So I, I feel you know, very proud to be in the tradition of a lot of these um, TV moms and to be part of comedy. Well, absolutely. Uh, you know, um, I know the book, your second act, I know the cancellation of the show was only partially responsible for that. Now, how did you get the rest of the, how did you compile the rest of the stories? Because it's not just about your stories. It's a bunch of. Yeah. Uh, so um, I, some of the people in the story are per, in the book are personal friends of mine. And then I worked with a researcher who was able to find some other people like Tao Pua, um, who was an NFL football player yes. originally from Tonga and raised in Utah who had an injury, which took him out of the NFL, but then he decided to pursue a career as an opera singer of all things. And he is now a very world renowned performer in the world of opera. And he's a wonderful guy. And he used the disciplines that he learned in football to study opera. And he was very systematic about it and very diligent. And he was super focused and he's such a wonderful, wonderful guy. And, yeah. um, you know, so there's that story. There's the founder of Dave's Killer Bread. Dave was um, in prison for a long time for, oh, wow. for, for drugs and, and, you know, smaller crimes. And uh, he learned a business skill in prison. And then when he came out, he went to work for his family's bakery and then created this wonderful bread that he makes. Oh, wow. And he also found out that he had, was dealing with some mental illness himself. Oh. And and yet this guy created this wonderful company despite all of it. And currently he sold his company and currently he um, works uh, doing um, collecting African art and promoting African art. So he has a completely different career now. But his story is really inspiring because he overcame a lot. And yeah. it's just incredible. I mean, I use I I bought his bread long before I knew that I would be interviewing him for this book. Right. You know, I um, I saw that um, you said it was a collection of essays from people who were who were mostly forced to change yeah. their their experiences. And another thing that I like that you said that it says it's um, there uh, at this point in time, uh, it makes you appreciate life more, which unfortunately it shouldn't take a pandemic to do that. But right. Well, I think we can. It's easy um, to get on a hamster wheel. And, you know, one of the great things about our country is it's full of people who are self-starters and strivers and, and, and our country gives so many people opportunities that they didn't have in their own homeland. Yeah. Why so many people want to come here because you, you can make something for yourself. You can achieve your dreams here. The other aspect of that is, especially for someone like me, I get very driven and it's easy to, you know, not stop and smell the roses that you just get on this hamster wheel <clears throat> of ambition and everything is about accomplishing stuff. And sometimes we need to be reminded that we need to stop and be thankful for our families and our friends and for what we have and for our freedoms. And that's easy to forget. And I think this pandemic was a huge wake up call for all of us to Absolutely. sort of reassess. And I think if listen, there are people who have lost their job because of this pandemic and they are going to be forced to pivot to something new. So maybe this book will give them some inspiration. But there's also people who still have their job, but are now thinking, is this the way I want to spend my life? I've now become so aware of how precious life is, how precious time is to be with my family and friends. I've reconnected with all these people that I haven't talked to in a long time. I know I've been doing that. And maybe I need to, maybe I want to do something different with my life. So I think that, uh, you know, this is a great time to explore that 
yeah. when you you know when we have um, uh, this pandemic going on. Yeah, you know, I think you know, no doubt the book is inspirational and motivational. I know it's going to help a lot of people, and I I would imagine coming at coming out of this COVID if that's ever possible, hopefully mm -hmm. that there's going to be a lot of second acts going on where people are going to have to, you know, I absolutely think you're right. I think, I think everybody is going to be very changed by this in small ways and, and big ways. And I think, you know, it's a great thing. I mean, it's, it's sad that there's so many people have grieving their loved ones that have been affected by this pandemic and have not been able to be with them. I mean, it's all awful stuff. Uh, but hopefully there will be some good things to come out of this also. Absolutely. And the, Patricia, if people want to get the book, I mean, is it available on all the major platforms? Yes. Your Second Act is available on Amazon at all of your bookstores. And I think it's also, a, you know, a great book club book because I there's pages, there's some work pages at the end of every chapter where you can take notes on what, how you felt about what you just read and what you relate to with the person's story and what you can take from their story and use in your own life. So I think it's a wonderful book for people to read together and then come together, not only to discuss what's in the book, but talk about possibly their own dreams and visions for something different in their life. Because I think it's great to come up alongside each other. It's often really good to have a partner or at least a, a mentor or a friend who's supportive. Yes. Because it can be tough to, to start a business or change careers, and you need people around you who are going to be supportive of you. So a book club is a great way to do that. Well, especially with that book. And, you know, they might have been hesitant. Maybe that'll give them that, that extra drive to make the leap. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yes, um, exactly. And uh, I, I, you know what, like I said before, watching you on TV has helped me so much to get through it. And I know I speak for everybody else. Um, I wanted to wish you uh, continued success. I just got to say, though, next time you get a sitcom, are you going to be like a little hesitant to get, to jump back in or you're, you're going to go? Oh, no, I'm looking for stuff right now. I mean, <laughs> I love to work, you know, and yeah. um, I, I have a little a little bit. I always have a little bit of identity crisis when I'm not working, right, um, right. which is why my pantry is super clean right now and that garage is on the way because I just have to throw my energy into something, you know, something positive. I mean, this this month, this July has, has been two years since I quit drinking. That's another big um, change in my life. Oh, and really? So, yeah. And I'll tell you, thank goodness I quit way before this pandemic. Oh, forget so, about it. Yeah. You oh, they would have found you on Skid Row. <laughs> oh, my God. I would have been cracking open that Prosecco at noon every day. You oh, know? my God. That's so, so funny. Um, that's been a huge change for me. And it's been wonderful, actually. I mean, yeah. I, I really miss bourbon. I have to say I miss bourbon a lot. <laughs> Sometimes I just smell it. I, you can't <laughs> escape the Irish. <laughs> I know, exactly. Um, but it's been but it's been, a, you know, a great thing. And, and I've so I've sort of taken all that energy and put it into just sort of trying to get the house sorted out after, you know, working so much, you let stuff pile up. And so, um, you know, it's been good. And I think everybody's been taking advantage of that to try to cook more and trying to perfect a paella. That's one of my projects. <laughs> oh, please. I can't. No more cookbooks, please, until I lose the weight. And then you can come out with them. Yeah, right. But I think you're doing it the right way. You're, you're keeping yourself busy. You're not getting caught up in all the anxiety. Right. And the next studio that you work for, please do them. Ask them for me. Can they give you a, a, a male lead that's under six foot? <laughs> I know. Because it seems like you get these giants. Flynn. <laughs> I know. I see, see those pictures. And just I always have to look up like that to, to talk to them. It's really it's a funny visual. That's why it you know, works. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Patricia right. Heaton.